Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 26, Making Multimedia. Hey everybody, good afternoon. It is 2.30 p.m. in the mountain time zone where I am, and wherever you are, I am happy that you took the time to join me here on The Take Up. Uh, I have a lovely episode coming up for you. I think it's going to be a fun one. Once again, a little bit light, maybe a little less technical than some of the ones we've done with the deep dives. Now, deep dives are coming. Don't worry, we're going to get back into super deep technical stuff. But I wanted to have something that was uh, something to feed your creativity, to kind of get you on board with some multimedia. So we're talking about multimedia execution. We'll talk a little bit about different kinds of multimedia. And honestly, I'm going to scale it back a little bit. I think that sometimes we see really cool stuff. We see multimedia. We see things that we want to do. And it becomes aspirational, sure, but it also can defeat people. They're looking at someone who's got tons of attachments on their machines, that has got tons of equipment they don't have, and it stuns them or it makes them feel like there's no way to get into it. And frankly, multimedia doesn't have to be that difficult. The hard part we have with that is uh, pricing it out when we're doing more labor. So there's a scale to be had between uh, labor and automation and equipment and uh, what we have to charge our customers to make things make sense. And we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff as we go and I'm really looking forward to getting more commentary from you guys. So please join in live in the commentary. Uh, talk about your experiences with multimedia. Ask your questions. And let's just get into it. Let's start First, let's start. I like to say hi to everybody who shows up and who's here listening live. So if you are live, jump into the comments. Say hi. Ask questions. Participate, guys. I want to have a good, fun time with this one because this is a really fun I think it's a fun subject, honestly. Multimedia is something that uh, it, it is really a way to make our embroidery something that's next level, that's interesting, that gives you more value. So let's go ahead and jump in and just see who's already here. Number one, uh, Mike Muldowney, awesome. Glad to see you here, Mike. Uh, and also I'm gonna show a piece you did about multimedia that harkens back to an earlier piece of education I did frankly. It's all just a big flat circle, isn't it, folks? Time just keeps on looping back in on us, especially those of us who've been in the industry for a while. We talk about all these things. So let's talk about this uh, with everybody here. We have Justin Armenta, digitizer himself, and uh, doing a lot of cool education on uh, MNerd, the MNerd group. Good Friday, everybody. So yes, good Friday to everybody who is there. And uh, yeah, yeah, you can hear me behind the thing. Yeah, I think I had a squeaky chair incident, very much like Terry Combs and Terry Regular Guys. And if you haven't seen two regular guys, uh, Terry Combs was out today, so I had to do the button pushing as well as co-hosting. Jump in on the Two Regular Guys podcast earlier from today, and you'll see all about uh, video lives, doing video marketing from Jason Rink of Simply Film. Really cool episode this morning, so I would recommend you go back and check that out. If you don't have uh, that already subscribed, go check out Two Regular Guys from today. And uh, hey, if you like to hear me yammer on, well, I was yammering on this morning too. So, <laughs> and I'll agree with Ramon on this one. What a day, what a week. Been a busy day, been a busy week, and I hope this is a nice pause for some of you guys. Uh, so let's see, Cindy King tuning in. Cindy says, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Cindy. Happy to see you. Uh, yeah. CST 330, good afternoon. Yeah, Central, when we have Aaron Montgomery from Jerry Lee Guys on, that's when his bit time is. Jerry Lee says, hey, dude, Jerry Lee, know that you've done tons of multimedia and tons of work in this space, so happy to hear you are on board. So yeah, feel, please feel free to share. Jeff, you're excited for this one? I'm excited too. Like I said, I'm gonna go a little basic this time. We might get a little deeper later, but this time I wanna inspire some folks to try multimedia and start from there. Uh, hi, Michelle, happy to see you here. Daniel, uh, great digitizer himself, award winner from the Impressions Expo. So he's done some really good stuff as well. Hi, to, happy to see you here, Daniel, as well. Uh, happy to see you, Honeybee Creations. Cannot remember, I know Aaron called you out by name. Call out your name if you want to, and I'll remember later. <laughs> Marley Scale Simmons, uh, I'm not even going to try your name, last name because I did it incorrectly, I'm sure. But uh, hello from the Florida Panhandle. Hope you are staying safe out in Florida and doing well. All right, Ellen, happy to see you from Omaha. Frank from over the across the pond in the UK. Hello, Frank. Good evening to you. Christine, oh, fantastic to see you here, Christine. I owe Christine a call because we have some stuff we want to talk about as well shortly. And uh, she says it was a good podcast this morning. Yeah, check it in. If you want to talk about doing content video lives, things like, hey, things like I'm doing here, content that makes you a subject matter expert, good to check in on that. Aaron, great to see you here too. Hey, all. Uh, and Jerry Lee loves some handmade paper. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've got links to that where I can show, but if you guys get over to the M Nerd group, uh, Jerry Lee has been doing some uh, paper and watercolor pieces, uh, light stitching on paper that you can then color in. And I saw that uh, Jeff was getting into that too. And uh, Cisco, 
Uh, good to see you here as well, Cisco. I saw that he started a group recently that has been doing some education as well, and that's really cool stuff. So thank you for joining in, Cisco. And <laughs> Sandy. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know you from your business name, but thank you for joining. All right, so we can say hi to everybody all morning long or all afternoon long or all evening long, depending on where you are. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and jump out into our actual topic today, and that is multimedia. So let's start with the absolute basics here in multimedia. Well, what do I mean when I say multimedia, folks? Uh, when I say multimedia in this context, we're talking about embroidery here. So this is primarily what we're talking about. We're saying we are embroiderers here. That is our primary mode of decoration. So for me, multimedia is anytime we're adding anything. And, I, and for me, I really do mean anything. Anything that is not thread on garment, you know, thread on object. Anything beyond that, in my opinion, is multimedia of some stripe. Now, somebody's going to say to me, okay, I don't think applique is multimedia. I do. I consider applique to be part of multimedia, especially because you can use different uh, media, a different medium for the applique, and some of the different kinds of applique have multimedia applications. Now, part of what we're going to get into is a little deeper than just slapping down whatever full color fabrics that are available. That is traditional applique, and that is probably, if you want to say it is the least, it's probably the least multimedia of uh, that particular one. So that's one of those things that is necessarily a little more multimedia if we are adding a printing step to it. And that's something I'm gonna talk about today certainly is that we can do printed multimedia, printed applique, and that's a basic kind. But this also includes every sort of other applied material or process. So we're talking about print with multimedia, with embroidery. We're going to be talking about using printed substrates. So that's like the applique stuff. We can talk about embroidering over existing prints. So the print is the base and the embroidery is, let's say, the additional, the added value that you're going to add to this thing. Uh, rhinestones, sequins, beading, anything in that nature, I'm going to consider that multimedia. And of course, printing over embroidery, which is a thing, uh, especially we're going to talk a little about sublimation printing with embroidery. That is something that is very much in my wheelhouse for multimedia, but that uh, I think is also kind of different. Now, I would say certainly, I like I said, I consider everything down to applique. Multimedia, I'm almost down to specialty threads where I consider it multimedia, because if you're somebody who comes from the old school commercial type of decoration where it was like it's logo decoration it is solid polyester or rayon thread in logo formats on garments that's the base that's what we're usually doing and anything we add on top of that is usually a value add or something cool that's beyond it uh, but this is something we can talk about in general right so applique yes and especially like i said we get into prints we get into other processes let's say we get into quilting things on which i have an example that i'll show you about that these things are all multimedia. So broad definition here, anything that we are going to add that is not by necessity embroidery, not embroidery by itself. So any applied materials, any additional prints, and also any additional treatments, including printing, laser etching, anything that we do that is not embroidery to a garment, to a piece, I'm going to consider that multimedia. So let's start there. Let's start with what that is, right? So that's what the multimedia is. So with that, let's go ahead and bring up just a couple of examples of some things. And we're just going to show some pictures. We're going to talk about the different kind of things I'm discussing. And we're probably going to drop some comments and we'll drop some links in so you can check stuff out. But first, I wanted to actually bring up, and I'm, I'm going to show that piece later. We're going to go ahead and pop up this little piece that I'm going to share you share with you guys in a second. I'm going to go ahead and copy this link out. And this is actually a piece that I did called uh, Applique Anyway right? Applique anyway, five methods for machine embroidery to applique. The reason I'm bringing up this piece isn't that we are just going to be talking about applique, because certainly applique is not the end all be all. It is not everything I want to talk about today. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because it shows something that I want to impart on everybody here, right? That I want to kind of make sure everyone is attached to. And that is, there are multiple ways to handle any one of these multimedia processes and the scale of which really depends on how much labor you want to do versus how much automation or how much equipment you can afford or what you have on hand. So you can absolutely do applique in any way from hand cutting with an applique scissor out to rip away applique. So this is an applique in a glitter flake. We're going to talk about this again later, but this is a heat transfer vinyl material that's laid down. You lay this down over a replacement stitch, run satin stitches around it, and you just tear it away. You don't have to do any cutting involved. 
and you heat press that on to seal it. So really the only specialty equipment on this, there's no cutting involved. This is the only specialty equipment would be the heat press to make sure this is affixed properly. And I know there are people who do this with irons or other sorts of home presses. I like to use a, a proper press with pressure uh, because it's something that I can control and it's very repeatable and fast. However, rip away applique, I think this is one of the great ways of showing hey, here is a kind of multimedia that is super simple, but adds a great deal of visual interest. And it's something that this particular kind of multimedia doesn't take a lot of excess setup. We think of multimedia and think of it as very difficult. This literally, it's an entire slab of, of uh, heat transfer material that is laid over a placement stitch and ripped away once that satin stitch is done and heat pressed in place so that it is permanently affixed. There's literally nothing else that has to be done. There's no precise placement. There's nothing else that we have to worry about. Something like this, I still consider multimedia and it can absolutely be effective as far as pricing. It's something that's very easy to do. No cutting, no setup, no files for cutting. Something very simple that can be done with just about any equipment. Like I said, aside from having to have a heat press or something of that nature. And then this right here, these are really incredible pieces. There's a guy named RJ Silva who does this awesome work where he does these hand cut applique pieces out of custom materials that customers bring to him. And he does really what he really does is like low trucks. So he does these kind of low rider truck, these uh, small truck culture stuff where it's all car culture stuff. And all of these clubs have him do these lovely custom pieces and he charges for them. He charges appropriately for them. So this is one of those things that I'd like to show people that you can go with any level of technology and still have a multimedia output. There is stuff you can do and it's really interesting. I mean, honestly, it's not outside of your reach and this particular piece, and I've seen other pieces he's done. One of my favorite pieces that I've ever seen from RJ was actually a serape that was cut out and it was made to look kind of like these classic serape purses that have a, a clear vinyl outside. And then you see the, the Mexican like serape material inside. And um, you put these th two layers together and it looks like that classic purse, that classic thing we've all seen, uh, if you've seen these before. And he made that into an applique piece that he hand cut. But the thing is, he, yes, he hand cut it. Yes, it's an incredible amount of effort, but he's charging a great deal for it. And that premium he's charging for it and the value he provides, not only does it get him to the place where um, he is valued by those customers, he's able to charge a higher price. And when they want normal, if you want to call it normal, standardized pieces where it isn't multimedia, where it isn't crazy applique, where it doesn't have additional pr printing or laser or anything else like that, they are going to go to him because he's the person who's done this cool work for them. They're also going to come for fairly standard work that he can do in an easy way. And so I would like to say, no matter where you are with your level of technology on this, there is some variety of multimedia you can do, you can explore. And the great thing is a lot of this stuff can be jobbed out. A lot of the things I'm showing here, when we, this is stuff you can do in-house. If you're doing just applique, you're hand cutting, you're placing, this is stuff you do in-house. You can do it anything up to and including a scissor and your applique <laughs> material, that's it. Aside from the embroidery machine. Embroidery I'm gonna take as a given. Everybody who's here, if you're not running embroidery, that's what I'm gonna say, right? That's, you probably, you're in the wrong space or at least you better be thinking about a machine pretty soon or getting it uh, jobbed out somewhere. But applique is something that any embroiderer can do with any machine and, I, and to prove a point, this piece that's up here was done on a single needle, super cheap home machine. And, and you know, it's, it's very simple. It's very much like a home project, but you can do that in a commercial space too. It doesn't mean you can't do that. So that's super, super easy stuff. Um, however, even when we're talking about the printed stuff and I'm gonna get further into it, right? I have some pieces that I've done and we're gonna talk about materials. We're gonna talk about all of this crazy stuff, but this is something that I'm gonna discuss again in a second. This is sublimated tearaway applique. And it's something I've done where the final pieces that you do, they look like this. You have a fully sublimated full color image that you pre-press onto glitter flake material. And it's something that I've seen done quite a lot. I mean, I did this piece quite a, a few years ago, but this full color pressed image that we can press on that polyester, that's the name, the glitter flake applique has polyester me media in it. So when you want to press that in, it will take sublimation quite readily. As you can see, it looks lovely. And so we can go ahead and press, press this stuff in. And the great thing about it is, because I'm doing it in this way, you can see up here when you're looking at the process shot, because I'm doing it in this particular way, I'm pressing a little bit more than I need to. Yes, there's some ink waste, absolutely. However, if you look at this, what have I eliminated from the, from the process of combining print and embroidery? 
this is something I'm doing without having to worry about super precise placement. I have a little slop. It's not a ton. I want to be close. But when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with multimedia, and a lot of times the difficulty really is alignment. This is the kind of thing that I could set up on multiple heads, and I'm not really trying to dead spot an exact location to get this set up. And so this is something I would love to kind of recommend to people. One of the things we can do is kind of subvert the difficulty of the multimedia by looking at the way we design. If we design for the product, we can actually start with a process that we know is going to be possible and reduce our commitment on the, pro on the production side. And that's what I'm saying with this. This is something we don't have to do precise placement. Whereas I have done pieces where I'm doing screen printed pieces that I'm going to drop in a single element. And I've had the kind of the unfortunate need to drop them very precisely. And sometimes what this means is I can't really easily without absolutely getting the hooping dead on. I can't easily drop something into an existing print without having some trouble. And I'll actually show a little bit of that too. I've done some individual pieces where the piece was not designed for multimedia, where I added something multimedia after the fact. And sometimes it can be very difficult to get precise positioning. So this is a really cool way to handle that. Rip away glitter flake applique with full sublimation. And I've actually got a couple of questions here that I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show people and say, here's the thing, uh, Jeremy says, did you sublimate that in house? Uh, yes, I did. But here's the cool thing about it. If you have a heat press, the thing is you don't necessarily have to buy into a sublimation printer. There are lots of people in the industry who will print you out sublimation transfers that you can then use and sublimate yourself. So yeah, I did sublimate this in house so that I could do multiple custom pieces. Now, and honestly, we had desktop sublimation at the shop I was working at. So when I did this particular piece, uh, we did have more than one I actually did more than one piece. You can see there's also a piece with chilies here and I'll go ahead and pop this up because I love this piece. This is my favorite. If you're from New Mexico, uh, everybody from New Mexico, go ahead and sound off. You know exactly what this is. When someone asks you, do you like red or green? You can say Christmas. <laughs> when you're, and what, that, what all that means is when you go to a New Mexican restaurant, they're gonna ask what kind of chili you want. The, and the question is always red or green. And if you're a true Albuquerque native like I am, or if you're a true New Mexico native, you're going to say Christmas pretty frequently. And that means you want both red and green. But here's the thing. That chili pattern is something that can be easily manipulated. I can move this around as long as I cover the placement lines on this piece, I don't have to worry. And the cool thing is if I've got software, like I know we have it in Imbrilliance and other softwares have multimedia as well placed into it, you can say, okay, I want an applique piece and you can go ahead and preview this stuff by putting your image into that uh, piece and showing this in your previews. And actually I, I mocked this particular piece up myself because I just wanted to work on the placement. And that's what I did when I was mocking up. And I originally had a third piece that I didn't get to. And I kind of wish I had, this is a lovely picture of the Sandia mountains uh, with a turquoise border. But the one thing I would love for you guys to know, here's another thing about multimedia. When you're working with something like this pre-printed material, you can see that I pre-printed that glitter flake applique. The thing I could do is use the same embroidery file on the same multi-head machine. If I threaded the needles differently or if I turned heads on and off as I go, as you can see, this hashtag ABQ that is on these two garments, right? Here it is on this particular garment done in a metallic thread with my uh, smiling mug up above it, done in a metallic thread at the very same size as this other piece. Here's the other piece, same design, no alteration, different thread color, different print inset. What does that mean? I could sit there on a multi-head machine and lay down different prints on each head and end up running all different prints all day long if I wanted to. Now, if I was doing digital production, Let's say that I could pre-print. I've seen people using uh, printer cutters for something very similar to this or uh, pre-sublimating pieces of uh, heat transfer vinyl in a very sim similar way. And that was done just the same way where they ended up doing multiple kinds of uh, permutations. You could have one design or a set of designs and use this same slab as long as it was the right size to cover the entirety of the placement stitch as you're seeing here and have multiples running on a multi-head machine and get better production mojo out of that. And it makes it much easier. So I'll go ahead and kind of bring it back to one of the things that I, I was going to discuss here. When we're talking about multimedia, right? We talked about what multimedia is. What are the three kind of, for me, the three watchwords that I'm looking for? Uh, number one is placement, obviously. If we are trying to do multimedia work, one of the things we're going to have to uh, deal with no matter what is placement. 
if we're looking to say drop something onto an existing embroidered print, let's say I'm dropping rhinestones and I want them to be precisely placed on a, an embroidered piece, the likelihood is I'm going to have to plan that placement ahead of time. If I'm going to have an all over or a multiple rhinestone placement or it has to lay into an existing design, I need to put some sort of marker or area so it's very easy for me to line up my uh, pre-made, usually a pre-made transfer where I've got some sort of clear carrier sheet that has the rhinestones on it that I can press in place and I'm going to have to have something to line it up. So the, one of the things you have to consider whenever you're working on multimedia of any kind really is placement. Whether it is all over pattern stuff, all over pattern stuff is much better. As you saw there with the chilies and I'm actually gonna show you another sample of a plaid piece I've done. Now, here's the thing, when I first started doing this, there were no printed applique that was really easy to use or I didn't see a lot of heat transfer vinyl materials that had patterns on them. Right now you can go and get plaids and all sorts of matter of transfer vinyls that have patterns and all kinds of colors and camos and everything on them. Uh, when I first started out, this, this was not really the case. So what I did a lot of honestly was take twill and sublimate it with all over patterns that were custom for my clients and then run those through. The cool thing about doing those things custom though is you can do things like uh, all over logo scatters, you can do things like uh, name or word art, and then use that either as an applique or reverse applique and use it as part of a design piece. So very much like I showed you the Ripaway applique, but with custom corporate logos or logo colors uh, that happen to be part of what that corporation, that custom uh, group would want to have. So you have that kind of stuff available to you. But no matter what you're doing, you have to think about placement. All over patterns, you're pretty much golden. There's a chance that you can have a little bit of wobble and it's really not going to look that uh, terribly off no matter what you're doing. So all over patterns are kind of like the shortcut to getting your placement right. The next thing to think about is having some sort of marker. And what I'll say is whenever I've done print first and embroidery on top of it in the print, I will tend to put in some sort of crosshair or other uh, element to line things up. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and bring my screen back up here and just show you some images. And this is something from, um, from an earlier set of pieces I did, and I'll show you a couple different images here, but this was actually one of the ways I handled this. And I'll have, go ahead and drop my banner out. You can see in this particular page that I'm showing you, um, I did a tear, like a, a rough cut applique with a chain stitch border, and it was laid down on a flock printed piece. Then the original piece here is, it was this flock printed uh, devil that you're seeing here for a Sandia prep, it was a prep schooled out here. And the way I handled this, instead of using a crosshair or something else that I'd have to worry about covering with my eventual piece, I actually realized that uh, the devil had a very sharp pointy toe right here. And it was a great place that if I was lined up roughly, once again, designed for it, that it would look fairly cool, fairly straight, just so long as I was close to having that point on the toe. And in fact, the great thing about this piece, uh, once again, designed for the medium, designed for the flaw, designed for the ease of production, uh, it was easy for me with a, an entire print. This was printed all the way under where the applique was going to go. So that if you wobbled a little bit from left to right, side to side, up and down, you're not going to have a gap or something missing that you can't see. This particular piece, not a problem because what was underneath it was what was expected to be underneath it, what the eye would fill in or the mind would fill in and expect to be there. We printed the entire devil. However, it was very easy to line this thing up and to be close. And because it was a rough cut vintage style applique, it made it very easy to have some slop. When something's vintage style, when something has a rough cut edge that frays, it's a little easier to get away with things like having some slop in your position. However, you can see how I lined it up. My start and stop point that I ended up putting on this piece was dead on that sharp toe and that helped me to figure out what I was doing. Now you can do that by setting that if your software does that. You can also do that literally by just having a point that's easy to reference so you can lay down a, a printed sheet and line up your original start point on your design. One way or the other, it still works. No matter what you're using, this is something to consider when you're trying to get your positioning correct. Look for a marker, a place that makes sense uh, for you to be able to drop something in on top of that print. So when you're doing print first and then embroidery after, Think about that alignment, think about a positioning or something that you're going to drop in. And this is just because I can, here's the actual eventual piece and you can kind of see what I was working with. So this was the flock printed distressed piece and there's the alignment that we had. And honestly, you can see this one's probably a little bit off the alignment. I would say it's just a little bit high. However, over the course of the pieces, it's something that wasn't uh, tremendously noticeable. And after washing where we got that nice curl that you get, on the edge of this uh, jersey knit applique. Uh, it's not something that was ever going to really show. However, it was something you think about. And I'll say when I have had to do precise positioning, and when I mean, say precise positioning, when I'm actually having to really get dropped into an area that I know is going to be um, exact, 
I will often throw one crosshair or even two crosshairs in the print, one crosshair to start my point, and then I will usually move in the design to a second crosshair, usually on both of them if I can, underneath my design so that I can travel between them if I want to. And I will drop the needle in one spot and then drop the needle in the second spot so I can make sure my alignment stays true on all the pieces. So that's something to remember. Print the stuff out ahead of time and think about where that is. When you have your printout first, have some sort of marker, tag, or reference points so you can drop things in. And, and this is the same thing with, uh, with rhinestones. Frequently, I've actually dropped in small circles of straight stitches when I'm doing embroidery with rhinestones after the fact. I can either drop in small circles of straight stitches so I can actually place rhinestones right on top of them, or honestly, if it's something where it's a scatter or there's a little bit of slop to it where it doesn't have to be exact, because rhinestones will fuse to thread pretty readily, at least my experience has been I've had no trouble uh, putting rhinestones directly on embroidery, I won't try and drop out stitches behind them or leave areas for them unless it's really necessary or the rhinestones make up a large portion of what I'm working on. And in fact, like I said, we can do this with any level of technology. I'm going to go ahead and bring my screen back in for a second. Here's a piece that a lot of people have seen before from me. And this is what I call the acanthus monogram. It's the side of a hood, right? Side of a hood. This is the other way you can handle this stuff. If you're making enough money. Now, remember, you got to charge for this stuff if you're going to do a lot of hand work. These were hand set. Now, they're hand set with a heat setter, with a heat tool where I'm literally just individually pressing down on each rhinestone. That's something you can do. And honestly, if you're making enough money, if you're doing a fashion piece or, or if you're doing the initial kind of sampling run for something that's going to eventually have transfers, you can start your world out by just doing it this way. Individual rhinestones, hand setting in the scatter pattern. And it's something you can just put on and try out. Uh, if you want to add rhinestones, you don't have to go out right now and buy a cutter or a rhinestone pick and place machine and a heat press just to get the initial trial out of the way. And in fact, one of the other great things you can do with this stuff is make your initial sample to sell this process to the customer as the order comes in. You go to somebody who makes rhinestone transfers. I have several people that I've used over the years uh, that design lovely transfers and deliver to them, to them to me on a carrier sheet ready to press. And I take my initial piece design based on the handset piece that I did match it up to the embroidery I'm working on, and I'm going to have those transfers ordered, have a couple of markers so I know where to place my transfer, and I'm gonna heat press it on in one big slab instead of doing it one piece at a time. However, like I said, if you're wanting to dabble, if you're wanting to start out and just get your feet wet or show it to a customer, there is no reason that you can't do that if you want to by doing some hand placement. As you can see on this piece, these are all just hand placed, individually placed rhinestones. Uh, once again, and this, no lie, this is a cheap, hand setting heat tool that was bought from a craft store. I use professional rhinestones to do it. So a little bit higher quality rhinestones than you would get from the craft store necessarily, unless you're getting the really high end rhinestones. I used the kind of rhinestones I was going to use eventually and actually got them from the same people who I used to make my transfers so that they were accurate. However, you can use hand setting to get that started. And after the fact, honestly, when we're talking about rhinestone tools, People will say, okay, do I need to have a multimedia piece of software to do this stuff? Um, can you use a rhinestone design software? Absolutely, I love lots of rhinestone design softwares that are out there. There's plugins, there's people like Rhinestone World. Uh, you, uh, there's several programs. I don't have to go into every program that does it, uh, but you can totally do it without because honestly, back in the day when I started this, even when I use automatic software to lay out, say a paved, uh, paved area, Frequently, I will go into my final file for the cutter and move individual cut circles around in the template to get it right. If I'm going to do my own setting or if I'm sending it off, I'll be honest with you, even when I use a design tool that helps me set the rhinestones and helps me get my positioning the right way, I find that I'm doing a little hand setting. In fact, I have an article, I don't have the link handy, I'm gonna put it out in the uh, description later, where I talk about the usefulness of hand setting or adding multiple different size stones in order to get lovely, smooth corners, curves, and things like that. So when I do a grindstone uh, template design, frequently doing some manual work on it anyway. So I would say if you really just wanna get into it, even if you are designing for templates, you can use any vector software, use the proper size circles that represent the cutouts for the template for your rhinestones and hand place them if you want. So there are all sorts of options. Like I said, this is a range from the least amount of technology to the most amount of technology and the investment. And it's a range for the least amount of labor to the most amount of labor. And then you have to look at what can you command price-wise, value-wise, 
that makes it make sense for you. Because the greatest thing is to get it where you've got a nice price going on and then find scales of efficiency or find technologies that make this possible for you to do down the road without as much labor. And honestly, keeping your price where it was when you were hand setting them is not a problem if you've convinced people of the value that these things have to work with. So those are a couple of things to think about. I am definitely gonna go ahead and show you a couple more samples here. So we talked about briefly Right, we had sublimation, and actually, I'm going to show you this too. We talked about the all over stuff. This is a piece from Mike Muldowney, who actually is often here listening. I'm going to jump out and show him because I've got a couple of pieces from uh, clients that I'd love to show you guys. And this is actually the piece from Mike before I, I'm scrolling through all this random stuff because I have so many things I'd like to cover. But this is the piece that Mike shared in the Emnerd group, and it's really cool. This is sublimation over foam. And what I would love to show this is kind of fun for me. I love this. Uh, Mike was actually watching a webinar where I shared someone else's piece. The other piece that I shared was from another often uh, take up listener who's here, somebody who's usually here. And that's uh, Tom Farr from Buzzards Bay Embroidery, which he does a lot of sublimation on 3D foam on hats. And so here Mike saw this and thought, I'm going to sublimate over 3D foam. The thing to realize about sublimation printing that's super awesome is that on a white polyester surface of any kind, you can sublimate lovely pop colors like this. And this is just on standard polyester thread. And it's actually a trick that's been around a long time. I will say, however, that sublimation technology and the inks are so much better now and more forgiving now that it is a fantastic way to go. It's something really fun that you can do. And especially great thing that we've done here, think about designing for production. You have to worry if you're using a sublimatable material underneath this, that you're going to get some sort of off-gassing or print on the material underneath it. If you don't use some sort of sacrificial layer, which some people will do, they will run some sort of tear away or other sacrificial layer and sublimate over it and tear that away so that they don't end up with any sort of off-gassing, something like that. If you use a black material, a nice solid black material underneath your embroidery and then sublimate on top of that, the likelihood is you're not gonna get any visible transfer that you can see. And that's another kind of cheat. And I've done it many times, especially with sublimated patches. So that's something I've done repeatedly is fully sublimated patches where you can sublimate on a polyester background. And what I'll often do is use a black border on those patches if the customer is amenable, because once again, I don't have to worry quite as much about the alignment and I can throw a, a full bleed over the top of them and you don't necessarily see the color when you press in. So that's something that I'd like to share with you guys, something cool that Mike did. And once again, here we have, what do we have? All over patterns, something where if there was a little bit of sway from one side to the other, you could forgive it. And what I would say is think about designing with a bleed. And I can go back to that other article that I showed you guys earlier. And we'll discuss that briefly if I can grab the one from images. And you can see, though you see in here my design where I've shown all this piece, you'll see that I designed it with that bleed. Now this one, I did a full square bleed. Like I really let that bleed go quite far so that I could place it exactly how I wanted to. And there was no chance of me going off, but you could very much, as you see here, where we have these outlines that are just the preview outlines. The original piece I did before I was a little nervous about the initial placements, I actually just went out to that outline and that was the bleed that I used on my actual piece. So you could also just cut back on some of the ink by cutting a contour that's just outside of your full design area. So that's something that's really cool. And I'm actually gonna bring up a comment really quickly here. And this is from uh, Jeremy Picker. He says, I can't find some on Puff in the USA willing to take recommendations. Well, I'll tell you, Buzzards Bay Embroidery is one of them. And obviously uh, Mike Muldowney out there, and I believe he's in Canada, is, is doing as well. What I would say is, hey guys, when you do things like this, when you do multimedia like this, if your competition doesn't, something I've found many a time in my career, you can command a higher price and you might find somebody like Jeremy who's looking for sub on puff. So think about that for a minute. The other value of multimedia is that if you do something interesting, not only do you find yourself being maybe the only person in your region or in your area in general who's going to do this stuff, and I don't mean your location, but I mean maybe in your niche, you'll be the only person who does this stuff, but you also set yourself up as an expert. When people see this really cool stuff, it's something I actually had a conversation with Jeremy, uh, who's in the comments here, Jeremy Picker of Amber Creative. I had this conversation with him previously that when you do this kind of stuff, it's not always the super crazy detailed stuff you sell. It's often that you make these samples, people have you do a couple pieces like this, or they do a small job like this, but they then trust you. They trust you to continue doing this work after the fact. They trust you to continue working on this stuff and to do simple work because they see that you have it down. If they see you do something cool and creative, they know you can handle anything that they consider beneath that. 
So it's something to cool for that. So that's something really interesting you need to think about, folks. Uh, and I have a couple of questions here. And they say, yeah, the sub press doesn't flatten the foam. How does the puff handle the heat from the press? Um, what I've found is a lot of people lighten the pressure up when they do this. And I'm going to say that I'm not going to give you any settings or anything because this depends on the foam you're using. There are different densities of foam. Some hold up to more pressure and more heat than others. But from what I've done, I didn't change my heat from my standard sublimation settings that were there for the ink and for the uh, for polyester. However, uh, some people do lighten up on the pressure because the pressure and the heat together really can flatten it to some degree. And I think there usually is a bit of flattening, but that's why people will sometimes back up on that pressure. I know Mike discussed it and he said that he had backed up on the pressure. So it was just in contact instead of being incredibly high pressures. So really, uh, I haven't seen any trouble with the heat. Does it shrink a little bit? Yes. For that kind of look, I mean, if you're going to get a look that is this uh, striking, Sometimes you put it with a little shrinkage. What I would say is go ahead and use a high density foam and something that's tall. Uh, you really want to get as much out of it as you can. So don't compress it too much and use something a little higher density if you can. But I think it's a very interesting piece. Now, while I'm doing the show and tell, I'm actually going to back out of multimedia kind of for just a second and say, I really love when you guys send stuff in show and tell because it makes me feel so awesome to know I've been a part of, this, of your embroidery journey. And so this is a commenter from the last week's show. Sue Greenstreet came on and said, Hey, I really loved your work, your pieces. I've been listening. And she listened to an earlier piece, an earlier episode where we talked about uh, we talked about breaking down large designs. And she said it gave her the courage to break down this large design when most of what she does is simpler work. And I wanted to say, look at this fantastic design from Sue. Uh, you gotta love this stuff. And this has some applique in it, but it's just a, a lovely big a uh, jacket back piece with some detail in it. And I would like to say thank you, Sue, for sharing that and for commenting. Every one of you guys, if you make a cool piece, share it in the comments, send it to me and let's talk about it. I would love to show your pieces on the show as well. So uh, from the very limited staff of the take up, <laughs> being me, myself and I, I really love to see this stuff that's inspirational. And I would love to see if any of you guys take on any challenges from multimedia. So let's go ahead and get back into it from that. Let's go to the other kinds of uh, steps that I think are really critical as far as that goes. But yeah, very cool stuff from Sue. Thank you. And by the way, thank you, Mike. I've shown Mike's stuff multiple times now. It's really cool to see that. So while we have some other stuff here, folks, uh, I'm going to say hi to some people. Alan Howe tuned in. Hey, Alan, great to see you. I've gotten to see you a couple times today. Missed your live, but glad that you were here and hanging out. Uh, knows a great deal about screen printing. Heck of a lot more than I know, folks. Uh, Julie, hello. It's Jules from Wisconsin. I caught you. Yes, you did. Thank you for tuning in from Wisconsin. Got lots of family out there. So take care up in the Great White North. Uh, love to see everybody getting in. Uh, Jeremy, ready to design for puff for foam. Come on, people. Puffy foam. Get with Jeremy because that is something you should do. It, it, advertise this stuff, folks. Really cool stuff. And by the way, lots of uh, lots of stuff going on for uh Sue here is so everybody saying, oh, wow, it is awesome. Christine, good grief, Sue. It's amazing work. Well done, Sue. We're here to support each other, folks. And I'm glad to say that I don't have to really reach when I'm supporting a piece that looks that good. Thank you, Sue, for sharing that with us. So really cool stuff. Once again, let's get back into the multimedia, though. If you have more stuff to share, if you have questions, you want to talk about it, definitely want to hear more from you guys. So let's go ahead with the second point that I wanted to make today. And it's something I've already discussed, but I think we'll go over it one more time. And that is to design for the media. Yes, you can do multimedia without designing for it first. I've done it many times. Uh, frequently enough, I've had a line of prints or something that was going retail, or maybe there was something that had a presentation involved for a creator or a maker or somebody who owned a store. And I would be making a specialty piece for the owner, for a launch party, for something that was related to the line but wasn't part of the main line. And frequently we would use assets or pieces from that line to create something totally unique. And I've done a lot of unique boutique pieces that way. What I'm gonna say from my experience is it's difficult, it takes a lot of time. And if you don't have to do that, uh, it's much better to design for the media first. So it's the stuff I showed you with the all over prints, number one, right? We wanna work on Removing some of this trouble with placement, that's one of the things that was always the most difficult when I'm working with stuff that was not designed that way. But we also have to design for the kind of materials we're going to use. If we're going to use materials that fray very easily in the design phase, we're going to want to think, number one, about what kind of support materials we can use to trap edges. Let's say we're going to use a heat seal material, something like that. But on some materials, let's say we're doing appliques or some other sort of applied material, 
uh, we can have fraying that is so pernicious that even using heat applied materials to back something or to stabilize something in that fashion uh, isn't enough to keep them from fraying. What sometimes is enough is using a large satin stitch border with a lot of structural underlay to hold down that fraying. And it's something that we have to think about ahead of time. It's really worthwhile to consider designing for the media you want to use. So no matter what direction we're going, right? If we're going from embroidery to print, if we're going to print on top of embroidery like we just saw, uh, design your embroidery in such a way where you have nice big flat areas of the white polyester so you can sublimate on top of it. If you're going to have uh, rhinestones, where the rhinestones are, even though I say don't just remove all the stitches, you don't want to necessarily build up a lot of highly textural, high crown satins or little bumps and ridges where it's hard for you to get a nice fix on the stones. Think ahead of what you're going to have. Now, especially if you're going to have something uh, kind of coexisting where you don't want things to touch, where things have to register carefully, you definitely want to design ahead of time for the media. The other thing that can happen with this kind of stuff too, you want to make sure that anything you're using is kind of can, is cooperative, right? We can't really do easily sublimating on say the white poly thread. If we're going to be on a light polyester garment, we're going to have to say, like I said, think about that process and design the process for the media. We're going to have to make sure there's some sacrificial layer or something else to help us out there. So whatever we're doing, we need to stop and think and design for the media. So both in the art phase and in the phase of designing kind of the process, we need to test ahead and think about the media first. So that's something really interesting to think about is what kind of media are we going to use for the multimedia? What are we trying to achieve? And what can we do to make it production friendly? Well, certainly, like I said, worry about your placement and either make sure you're putting in some sort of marks that you can track so you know where to place your second medium uh, or the set you can put in the second process, but also make sure that the kind of materials you're using are conducive to being used with the process as well. Uh, it kind of makes the same sense with anything else we're working with. If we're talking about materials that uh, we only have a roller cutter or we're gonna be cutting by hand, if we have a material that's super difficult to cut or won't cut with a plotter cutter, well then that's something we might not wanna put into production unless we absolutely have to. Or we're going to look at the other thing we can do when designing for the media, and that is uh, designing your team of people you're going to bring in on this. And this is something actually that I discussed with uh, Jeremy once again, talking about process that we can do. You don't necessarily need to have all of the equipment to get this stuff done. Even if we're talking about cutting processes for specialty applique, we can hire people in, especially when you're doing applied things, not as easily done with say reverse applique where we're cutting out of the garment, when we're in setting something, we're putting something behind the garment and cutting the garment layer away. That stuff is much more easily done as a single process by someone who has either say like a bridge laser on their machine or that someone that has some sort of laser setup where we can put our registered garment right into the laser and it stays in the hoop and we can take away those elements. So reverse applique, unless you're doing it by hand, which I'm gonna show you that too. Uh, if you're doing it on a production scale, that might be something that you want to have somebody who's doing the entire piece and you're just subbing the entire thing out. But when we're doing just applied materials, say specialty materials, you can totally hire somebody who is a laser cutter, somebody who has that fee structure built in. Usually it's on an, a per inch basis of the line that you're cutting and they will cut the material for you. But then when you do that, you need to make sure you discuss with them what kind of materials cut well for them and what they're set up to do. Uh, honestly, usually it's not a problem, but you can sub out a lot of the stuff. Same thing with the sublimation. You can subcontract the production of those, those initial uh, transfers. You can do that with the rhinestones. You can do that with screen print as well. Screen print transfers are a, an old school method. People have been doing it forever. There are multiple places where we can go get that stuff done. So all we need to do is make sure that when we do that, we're designing ahead for what we want to do. So when we're designing our screen print transfers, usually you're going to be printing and then embroidering on top. In your transfer, you're going to put in your placement marks. You're going to make sure that you have everything where you can line it up and make uh, ready sense for you to do the process. If we're doing something like the laser cutting, we're going to talk to somebody, bring in someone who knows how to cut the material we're dealing with. We're going to talk with them and make sure that they can handle that and get the cuts made ahead of time. Uh, we're going to plan for overages. So if we have any uh, pieces that get ruined, there's going to be some spoilage. We're going to work on that and make sure that we have that put together before we do that. And we're going to plot and plan and discuss with people who have that uh, critical kind of knowledge ahead of time. Also, if we know we're hand cutting, we have to digitize our files so that we have hand cut lines and that we know what we're doing there. It's a different kind of applique file if we're going to put a hand cut line than if we're tacking down a cut piece. So no matter what we're doing, we need to think about our media, 
So what kind of materials are we going to use? What order are they going in? How do we want that to look in the end? And then we need to think about our process and design ahead of time with that in mind. So this doesn't have to be super difficult though. Once again, I think this is just something we take a little thought ahead of time and work out, not a big deal. You can even, like I said, you can get by without doing this when you're making your initial test pieces. But I would always say from the art forward, from the initial concept forward, when you're discussing this with a client, you want to design for multimedia and talk about that ahead of time. So designing for the media is something that I think is fairly important. And of course, that includes kind of the last point of that triumvirate of points I want to bring up for people. And that is that you need to know your materials. You have to know how things are going to behave and what can and can't be done. I'm not going to say you're going to jump in and immediately know everything. Uh, one of my favorite multimedia pieces I've ever done, and I'll see if I can bring up an image. It's something I didn't actually plan ahead of time to bring up. But I'm going to go ahead and see if I can grab this for you on the fly because, hey, why not? That's how we like to do things. I'm going to actually bring in my screen here just so you can see this. And uh, this piece here is a company, a local salsa company that we did a piece for called uh, Gilly Loco. And uh, this piece is done with a custom applique that was cut from essentially, it's like a, uh, it was a faux alligator, faux reptile print. It was molded, right? It was a molded faux print that is rubbery. What I'm going to say is I wish I had known my materials. Can this be done? Absolutely can be done. This inset piece was cut on a plotter cutter, an old, old Roland Cam 1, essentially a sign vinyl cutting uh, machine. And it was done with standard vector that I pulled out of the logo. And this logo, believe it or not, despite the fact that I have often made jokes about such, uh, this was pulled from an original logo that I had done for them for another piece, resized and refactored and made to work with applique. So this is a piece that had fills and detailing and stuff and shading all inside of this original piece. I pulled it all out and made an applique piece out of it. So let's go ahead and bring up the full piece for you, a raw image of that full piece. And this is what the original, uh, the eventual piece looked like. The thing was, I absolutely did not know my materials for this piece. If this hadn't been a rush that was being done for a holiday party for 15 to 20 you know, elite people who are getting this piece, I wouldn't have done it. We were getting paid a tremendous amount, so it made sense to do it. However, these took too much work and the materials did not cut well on the plotter cutter. I had them mounted to a clear carrier film with an adhesive. This stuff was incredibly stretchy. And so it was constantly running off track, snagging. And even with the really aggressive 60 degree uh, blade that I was using and changing out blades, this stuff did not want to cut straight. However, what did I do to co compensate for that in this applique? I essentially used a very wide satin stitch. I used a much thicker satin stitch than I might have done elseways. And in places where there are going to be narrow cuts, I went ahead and covered the entire area in stitches and used an extra satin border, as you can see here, rather than having narrow cutouts. Why? Even on the fly, I was designing for my material. Would have been better to know it ahead of time. After the fact, when I did my first cut, when I did my first test, it was very clear to me what was going to happen with this material, and I managed to make it work. And honestly, the, the look of the piece is actually pretty stunning up close. And when you get a nice like off angle shot, and I might have one here that's kind of an off angle shot. I think this tight shot of the tail is good enough. But you can see that how cool that uh, that texture was, and it really did make this thing pop. And it's what I like to call free visual interest. When your material, when your applique has something printed on it, it has a color variation that's cool, has texture that's cool, it's something that I don't have to digitize for specifically, and I get all of this visual interest without having to uh, make anything else difficult out of it. So, you know, that's something that we can talk about. It's like, you should know the material, but realize, you can use these unique materials and as long as you're being paid for the process, very much like RJ that we talked about earlier with his hand cut stuff he does for the car clubs, you can make it work with extra manual labor. This would have been much better to do with someone using a laser cutter. Absolutely, 100%, someone using a laser cutter would have had a much better time doing this and I should have shopped it out if I had the option. So once again, what you do when you're being inventive is one thing, what you really need to do is a different thing. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pull in a couple more comments here or at least one more comment. Uh, Jeff says, it makes me think of all the in the hoop projects. Yeah, if you're someone who comes from the craft side of this world, the embroidery world, uh, craft and home market, there's a ton of stuff they call it in the hoop or ITH, you'll see uh, the, as the abbreviation, in the hoop projects are often pieces that are made of multiple layers and you can make objects like pencil cases is a very common one. And uh, 
little hand sanitizer pouches, things that you use the embroidery machine for the construction stitching to make. And usually there's a, a place in which you will turn something inside out or flip it or something. And you will put this thing together with all these steps. The thing is, that's these all have the same kind of essential basics as you have for multimedia. You will have to worry about placement and honestly within the hoop uh, projects that's incredibly precise. You have to be very close to the bone to make sure these things all turn out. Uh, and you do have to design for your medium. You would have to know how materials stretch and how they operate. And you know how to do the construction. You'll have to make sure your construction is correct and know your process from beginning to end. So honestly, home market people probably have a little easier time than people who are super business to business who have never done anything beyond, I put the logo in the left chest and I make it run. That stuff is great. And honestly, that's fantastic. And the digitizing behind that can be very difficult depending on the difficulty of the design itself. But with multimedia and materials, the hardest part is getting the entire holistic method down. What do I do first? What do I do second? How do these things interact with each other? And how does my process work so it is repeatable, simple to continue on through each step, and that I'm getting a consistent process throughout a consistent finish throughout so that's the thing yeah people right now and this is frank brings this up haha -ha, in the hoop masks done loads yeah that's the thing that if you hadn't done in the hoop stuff before the crisis has probably made you do at least something in the hoop lately and the thing is there's incredibly complicated in the hoop stuff that home uh, market people do i would say most of the time in the commercial market it doesn't make sense have i made in the hoop projects commercially absolutely i have much simpler projects than I've seen done out, out in the home market world where you're adding zippers and all these objects and things as you go. That is something I probably wouldn't do commercially because I can't make enough money per piece to make sense out of it. Usually I want commodity garments or some sort of garment that I can decorate myself. What I have done, however, a lot of is multimedia pieces, specialty applique, uh, rough cuts, felt and things like what I'm actually going to show you here. Um, this is one of the other articles that I can also share with you guys. We have one where I talk about how to uh, take your embroidery to the next level. We're going to talk briefly about the multimedia you can see on this particular piece. I'll go ahead and give you guys this in the comments. We have pieces where you uh, do some just some really basic customization. And this is one of the pieces I'm talking about. This is just a custom print. Now this one, honestly, not my best custom print, but this is just using sublimation on white twill. Uh, unfortunately, the camera picked up a little too much shine off of this twill. This twill is a little too shiny if you ask me. And this was a standard uh, pressure sensitive poly twill that you can buy. Uh, and this was pre-pressed with this particular uh, plaid pattern that was selected by the client, by the corporate uh, entity, and the colors were Pantone matched for their corporate colors. That's something that's really easy to do and it's a simple kind of multimedia, but it still has multiple processes. What did I end up having to do to make this work out? Well, for me, I went ahead and pre-cut all the letters. Letters had to be pre-cut and I made placements. I actually made placement sheets because I couldn't use too many of these sheets together. I made these gang sheets that had letters stacked as close as I could together. And then I made prints ahead of time that I cut the underlying material so you would line up the corners on the printed sheet, because I was using a desktop uh, a desktop sublimation printer at the time, you line up the sheet of twill with the corners of the sheet of, uh, of transfer paper, stick it under the press, and when they were lined up, they were in proper alignment, had a full bleed over the edge of the pre-cut material. So the sheets were pre-cut, the letters were pre-cut on a plotter cutter, plain old vinyl plotter cutter, and then pressed on top, with a full bleed that was lined up on the edges. So that's one of those things, guys. It, it's literally just thinking about the process in order, in sequence. It's literally just thinking about what you're going to have to do and how you get that alignment done. And that's really the crux of this kind of multimedia. Aside from knowing your materials and knowing what can be done, obviously I can't use cotton. I can't use something with a heavy texture if I'm going to be doing sublimation. It's probably not going to look as good as if I use something smoother. If I use something, of course, that's 100% polyester that also is white because as you know, with sublimation is you sublimate on top of a color, you get a blend between the sublimation dyes and the color that's existing in the garment. So you have to design with that ahead of time, obviously, and your art has to be designed for the process. So in my art, I have to have a little bit of bleed contour that's beyond the edge of my original art of the, my finished piece so that I have that edge in case I don't quite hit. I have that extra bleed that goes out beyond the cuts. And this is something that I've written articles about and I can share uh, more detail. For right now, all I want you to get through your, kind of through your process, get 
kind of boiling in the back of your head is thinking about the order of operations in your multimedia, thinking about how you would get your placement correct, thinking about how materials interact with each other and making sure that the processes you're going to use are going to be compatible, and then designing your art to make the best use of your time, your effort, and the materials involved. If we can get that as the watchword, that's the kind of sphere we're living in, you can then use that to develop all kinds of cool stuff. And honestly, a lot of the stuff you've seen here really, I think, fails on some of those <laughs> on some of those rights. This particular piece, I think I would do it again and the materials weren't as good. Once again, this is something where by the seat of my pants, I did a piece for people, worked it out, made it happen, they were happy. But if I were doing it again after learning, I would say I need to test more materials and probably have this twill cut ahead for me done somewhere else that wasn't in-house. Now for this, this ended up being an online fulfillment piece that I had to be able to make small numbers in-house from materials I had on hand, but didn't want to keep extra materials on hand. That's something where it made sense for me to do this custom. However, I would say if I was doing this again and doing a massive program, I would probably pre-order a bunch of press materials, or I would have this custom material printed ahead of time and cut, and I probably wouldn't touch much of it at all myself. The thing is, when I'm doing the samples and selling it, you can absolutely do this as you would like to. So one of the couple other uh, examples I wanted to show you, here is another piece that has some uh, multimedia that I think is interesting. And this was a piece that was done for one of those launches that I talked about, this is for an art gallery. And this is screen printing that was then quilted and then 3D embroidery and 3D lace embroidery added to the top of it. So this particular piece here, this is essentially a screen printed t-shirt that I then had hand quilted. Now, once again, this is something that you're going to have to charge for. You cannot make this for everybody for the lowest common denominator. This particular kind of multimedia is boutique. This piece was taken from an original screen printed piece that was part of the line. It's called Dragonfly Goddess. And after that thing was done, we cut the piece out and it was put on a denim jacket with a light layer of uh, polyfill behind it. So it had some quilting material behind it and it was hand quilted by someone with a with a machine. So hand guided quilted done, done around all of these printed areas. So the initial piece actually had all of these contours done all around this woman that was here. Uh, and then the last piece here was to add this embroidery. And what you can see if you get close in on this piece, and I'm actually gonna go ahead and jump into the piece in a larger format so you can see it. This is a little bit more of the print itself. But what you can see from this print, if you get close to it, and I'll zoom in so you guys can really get a shot at it, this was done where I digitized the Dragonfly custom as an echo. It looked just like a Dragonfly that was in the piece. Now the colors weren't exact, but I did use a Dragonfly that was in the existing art. And the problem we had with this one is especially, this thing was quilted on top of fiber fill, it was puffy, and it was using a knit material in the background this shifted a lot when you ran it and it was very hard to keep the alignment and because the printing this was not designed ahead of time the art was not edited or changed for multimedia this was just done as a multimedia piece on top of an existing design as you can see it was a pretty small amount of flaw but if i bring my cursor over here you can kind of see um this was really a little off this the little side of the body of the dragonfly does not line up with the print Underneath the wings, you can see the other wings, luckily being 3D lace. Uh, and these were actually done, once again, we're talking about the order of operations on this piece though, because this is kind of interesting if we discuss it. Um, the order of operations for this particular piece was that the printing was done ahead of time. This was done with an existing printed piece. So you know you already had the print that is in place. The second thing that was done is separately from everything else, the wings were run on a water soluble uh, background on a water soluble stabilizer and they were done as a freestanding lace. So the wings on the dragonflies were all individual pieces. It was a, it wasn't individual pieces per wing, but the four wings together were one piece of lace that actually goes underneath and connects. So you have one wing set that was made as a lace piece for each of the dragonflies and each of the dragonflies is actually a different uh, set of wings. And then the last thing that was done is once this was quilted and in the hoop, the dragonflies were individually placed and aligned. You would lay down your existing wing set and then the body would tack down the wings and the body of the dragonfly ran on top and ran flat essentially. So I had a traditional embroidery body that was stitching down as a construction element holding down these wings. So the wings were free floating and flapping but the rest of it was actually on top of the print. So once again, this is the thing where we think about our order of operations. If I had this to do again, 
I would probably go ahead and take this art. I would have specific blanks printed that did not have uh, the dragonfly printed on them. Instead, I would have had some sort of marker, some sort of starting position point so that I could place the dragonfly exactly where I wanted it. I still would have done the uh, 3D wings the way I did them. It wasn't something that was very difficult to do, and I ran those all separately before I did the rest of the piece. Uh, but I would definitely do a marker. That way I wouldn't have this strange alignment where I have this kind of awful little echo where you've got this line around the outside edge where you can see the other dragonfly that was there. Honestly, it looks like a design element, but it's not a design element. It is a little bit of a flaw. So that's something that I think that is worth, it's worth looking at. But once again, the way to get this through your head, the way to kind of boil this down is to think, what am I putting together? What's the order they're going down in? And where do I have to leave room for it? So it's one of those things that I really like to show. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and bring in a couple more images to show you what I was talking about. These are the two sets of items that were done for that, uh, the Keller Williams piece. You can see that on the right hand here is the actual printed piece after it was done. On that right hand side, this is the twill. That's the twill after it was printed. Or actually, on the left hand side is twill after it was printed. On the right hand side is the transfer. And that's the sublimation transfer. On the left-hand side, you'll see that I pre-cut that twill into a shape that was the same size as my transfer paper to make alignment really, really easy for uh, non-skilled technicians who are going to be running the piece. I had non-skilled operators or people who are not really familiar necessarily with the art. I didn't have to have them familiar with the art. They just had to line the correct corner, the correct side. And honestly, you could have flipped it both directions and it was uh, equal on both sides. So you couldn't mess it up as long as the corners were lined up. So that's one of those things where you think about your process ahead of time in your design. And uh, honestly, everything was packaged together, ready to rock and waiting for everybody to get done. So that's something that you think about ahead of time. Also, one of the other things, like I said previously, slop is always useful. We did this as a uh, contest entry. Using pieces where you can allow for a little bit of placement slop is very useful. Another very similar piece that had a quilted printed background uh, with embroidered pieces on top. Using these lovely light embroidered pieces as you see here, uh, they could be added to this piece. And if they were a little off center, if they weren't exactly where they were supposed to line up, it was pretty simple for us to uh, get away with that because the look was not entirely damaged by these pieces being there. So these lovely open single color pieces that I digitized, uh, very easy to lay down. And in this kind of retail space where they're just supposed to be additional items, they don't take the place of anything and we allow the print to interact with them. Uh, these things really are easier to handle and they're designed to be that way. They're designed so that you don't have the difficulty of placement. So once again, I think that that's something useful to think about. I know that this is maybe not as deep as you might want to go. Like we can, we could go deeper. The thing is, no matter how far you want to get into it, and I want to show you this too. No matter how far you want to get into it, there are options for multimedia. Now you can go to, and this is stalls, but there are other people who do this work. You can go to a heat press materials seller and get things like distressed applique that are pre-made for you. You can even go ahead and send them custom art. They come to you sewn together in a stack with heat press uh, adhesives on the back and you can immediately press them onto garments. So the stuff that I used to do as difficult, you know, rough cut appliques and crazy stuff that you couldn't get done, you can now have done and subbed out. So no matter how much inter, you know, no matter how much involvement you want to have, you shouldn't let a lack of equipment interfere with making interesting uh, textural multimedia pieces because it's available to you in so many different ways. I would say if you have one thing you probably want to get out of all of this, right? Of the different things that I've showed you, what would be the most useful as an equipment addition to your embroidery machine is absolutely a heat press. Uh, quality heat press, you can control pressure and temperature is going to make any one of these things much easier to achieve. Sublimation can then be done with ordered out transfers. You can get screen printed transfers. You can have someone with a pick and place rhinestone machine put together rhinestone transfers for you that have everything on a carrier sheet ready to go. And then when you're planning that with your embroidery, all you have to do is be aware and keep things at scale, work at the final measurements so you know things will line up in the end. If you can work at the final measurements, be aware of your position and placement, and you can essentially design holistically knowing what media you're going to work on throughout the process, you don't necessarily have to have attachments. Now, would it be nice? Yeah, totally. There are incredible attachments. These ones I'm showing are ZSK attachments because a lot of people have seen these at the uh, trade shows. 
would it be awesome to have this incredible seed beading attachment so that we can run and drop seed beads on everything? Absolutely, these are super cool. Um, not everybody's gonna have these. And I would say that you can get a similar look and feel out of a rhinestone transfer. Does it mean that there's no use for these? Absolutely not. And in fact, I think if you end up in a place where say you're doing a lot of home decor, you're doing a lot of specialty work, you're doing a lot of fashion work, and this kind of design element is something your clients want, one of the great things you can do is mock something up, have this done somewhere else, and justify that multimedia and bring it in, bring in the specialty tools. However, for those of us, you don't need necessarily to have this. What is it awesome if you can use your software to create your stitch line and use, say, a, a heat cutter like this? This is a hot air cutter. Or you can, can you use an onboard laser? Those are awesome. They make a lot of things possible. However, it doesn't mean you can't do work. I mean, this is a uh, reverse applique. It's a piece that I won an award for. And this was done essentially with a small trimming scissor. That's all it was done. Would I do this in large scale production? Probably not. I'd probably want this to be done by somebody with a laser. I'd probably want this to be done in some better process. Can it be done? Absolutely. Can I use it to make a proof of concept to sell this to a client so that I can get the equipment that I want down the road? Absolutely. And honestly, there's no reason not to examine materials, not to examine multimedia, just because you don't have all of the fancy equipment that you might need. And like I said, this is something where in all honesty, no matter what software, no matter what equipment you're using, there is a possibility to do it. And I would say if you've got an embroidery machine right now, and especially if you've got an embroidery machine and a heat press, uh, incredibly versatile, and you can use these to make all manner of multimedia as long as you keep those kind of central tenants in mind. Uh, so with that, guys, I think we're going to go ahead and close it out here. Not a lot of bonus time because I didn't want to go super deep into any one topic. If there is one topic or one process you want to get deep on, you guys want to talk a lot of applique, you want to talk a lot of printing or sublimation, you want to discuss how to do printing with that or get into something deeper, please let me know. Get in the comments and let me know. Ask questions, talk about it. Uh, because that kind of stuff will feed what we get into when we get through the final show. And I know, like I said, from here in the Brilliant Studios, we try stuff out all the time. We try all sorts of different materials and treatments and processes. But what I always want to look for is that kind of nexus between what can we do with the equipment we have? So that's why you'll see people combining these things with the other things we've talked about in previous episodes. Imagine now you take that applique, maybe an applique with sublimation, then we use specialty thread, then we use thick thread, or we sublimate on top of polyester thread, but we also use a different kind of thread on top of it with a different texture. Because this just adds to our equipment. It adds to our arsenal of things we can do to get visual interest. So what are the things we usually use to get visual interest out of embroidery, right? We use color. Well, I mean, color and design, certainly. The shapes that are present, the colors that are present in our design, the colors of our threads we are going to use for sure. Then we have the qualities of the thread itself. We use the sheen of the thread. Is it shiny? Is it dull? Is it rough? Is it furry? We use texture both in the thread itself. Does it have a fuzzy texture or is it thick thread? And texture of the embroidery itself. Does it have multiple applications of satin stitches? Is it carved? Is it using a fill stitch? Is it using a randomized fill stitch or a regularized fill stitch? Is it smooth? Is it rough or organic? Those are the things we use to establish differences in texture and to make our embroidery look different. Our mark making with stitches look different. We can use those to make visual interest. Then we can add materials. We have our glitter flake applique. We, now that gives us a shiny, glittery look that we can add to it. We can use applique from all sorts of materials. I showed you AJ stuff or RJ stuff where he's doing the serape material or the linen material that he was using. So we have all the different textures, colors, and materials that are available in our applique material. And then we add things like specialty threads to that mix or sublimation printing or screen printing. We can stitch over the print. We can print on the design or we add rhinestones, sequins, and any manner of things on top of it, we can build these layers of items together and use them to get visual interest. Do I think we wanna throw everything and everything? Absolutely not. I'm not saying you wanna throw all those together. The cool thing is when we start to let this germinate in our minds and say, okay, I'm bringing in all of these outside influences, all these different kinds of creative media that I can work with, let those knock around in your head and new things will come together from that kind of primordial soup of embroidery and artistic expression 
those things will kind of form into something more solid as you think about them. So let these things, these different options form in your mind. Think about stitching over applique. It's another thing I, I'm going to show one more time these samples that I have over here from this Power Up article because I think this is another one that's super simple that everybody seems to love. It's this FDNY piece I did back when I was doing stuff after 9-11. And this is simple, simple, light contour stitching over an applique. And it's not like it's difficult to do. And it's not something that anybody couldn't do right now. The fact that I used contour stitching, this is all the same color. The red is the same color as the borders. This is a single color applique with a standard cut twill. But the little amount of using density to our advantage, using spacing to our advantage, and the thread and the style, the natural inherent style, that free interest that contour stitch, stitching gets us because thick and thin columns get less dense and more dense as you use them, makes these flames have a certain life to them. And then layering gives it even more. Little touches, little touches layered together, little elements that we put together, tiny touches of multimedia, a little bit of adding to the pot, a little bit of rhinestone addition, replacing a dot over an eye with a single rhinestone on each piece that doesn't take you a long time, but adds a little shine. These things are going to add additional value. They're going to establish you as someone who's cr creative, who has options, who can give more visual interest. And I think that in all honesty, anyone here with an embroidery machine and a little bit of <laughs> intuition will be able to make multimedia that works out well. So. Mind your placements, design for your materials, and think about your process ahead of time. And I know you can make awesome multimedia pieces. So come back next week, guys. Show me stuff you tried out. I would love to see you test some things out and ask questions in the comments, share this with your friends, and be here for another take-up. So with that, guys, I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I cannot wait to see you back again.